Hello everyone and welcome to another recorded lecture of Bio 101 online. Today we'll be talking about chapter 4, which is cell structure and function. So as we mentioned in the very beginning in chapter 1, we said that all organisms are composed of cells. And a cell is the smallest unit of life that can function on its own. And being composed of cells is one of the most basic characteristics of life. So if you are not made of cells, you are not alive. Interestingly, cells were not discovered until microscopes were invented, and that wasn't until the 17th century. And you can imagine that there were a lot of misleading theories um, that prevailed until um, cell theory was established. And cell theory is currently accepted um, right now. And I'll talk about cell theory in a couple of slides. But right now, I want to explain just how uh, crazy some of these theories were. People thought that you would get flies by leaving meat out, that flies would spontaneously generate from meat. People had no idea that flies would lay eggs or the concept of development uh, from sperm and egg. Another equally crazy um, theory was that to get mice, uh, there was this recipe to take your dirty shirts and put wheat in the pocket. Um, and then when you wait 21 days, you will get mice. And this was an actual doctor who published this. Uh, he also published a recipe for scorpions. So this idea of spontaneous generation was actually accepted. Now it seems preposterous. But before cells were discovered, um, there wasn't any reason to believe that there was, uh, you know, two cells come together and start dividing and then they start differentiating and be becoming an organism. That was that was preposterous to them. So it wasn't until Louis Pasteur um, did this very clever experiment um, that spontaneous generation was disproven. So this is when we see, I want you to actually try your best to interpret um, what he did over here. What he took was three flasks with meat in them. He left one unsealed, one sealed, and one covered with gauze. And again, this his goal was to try to disprove spontaneous generation and the idea that flies came from meat spontaneously. So pause the video here and try to tell, uh, try to write down in your notes, first of all, what's the control and is this a good experiment? And second, what do the experimental results indicate about spontaneous generation? So hopefully you gave it some thought and sure, and sure enough, in an unsealed flask, you do see flies come. But when the flask was sealed, then no flies uh, generated from the meat. However, if you put gauze on top, flies were attracted to the meat and started laying eggs on top of the gauze. So uh, this was proof that it was the flies being attracted to the smell of the meat and laying their eggs there. So they still laid their eggs on top of the gauze, even when the meat was out of the picture. So that is a very famous experiment that disproved the idea that living things can come from non-living things. So now, um, and you could grow, this is a good article if you want to read about that. So it wasn't until cell theory um, was first developed in the 1800s that we really began to understand what cells are and that living things are all made of cells. So once we can use microscopes, we can understand what living things look like on a microscopic scale. So the tenets of cell theory explain commonalities of all cells. So this was established by a group of scientists independently and the botanist, so he worked with plants, Schleiden, um, these were all German scientists. There was a, zoo a zoologist, Schwann, and a physician, Virchow. And the three of them are known to have established cell theory. And those theories, uh, the theory has different parts to it. The first is all organisms are made of one or more cells that we know. The cell is the fundamental unit of life, right? And all cells come from pre-existing cells, right? This was from uh, Virchow and that's, um, from one cell, all cells come. 
And this is direct, uh, directly against spontaneous generation, which says that you can get cells from, or you could get life from non-living matter. But cell theory firmly establishes that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Um, to add on to that, we could build on concepts we learned in chapter two uh, and chapter three to know that all cells have the same basic chemical composition. They have the same building blocks, the same lipids, proteins, carbs, and nucleic acids. Um, all cells use energy. And as far as nucleic acids, all cells contain DNA that is duplicated and passed on as each cell divides. You must know this. So this is true of all cells. So as we move forward in this lecture, I want you to pay special attention to what all cells have in common compared to how different cells are different from each other. So that should be a very um, a recurring theme. I want you to be able to compare and contrast. So now I want to talk a little bit about microscopy because obviously cells are too small to see without a microscope. So we need to understand just a little bit about microscopy um, to understand how cells are visualized. So a light microscope is one that you've probably used before in high school um, or in middle school. Um, and a light microscope could be used to view entire cells um, and other objects. An electron microscope you probably have not seen before, um, and that's used to view parts of a cell and viruses, which are very, very small. So viruses are um, down here about 100 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter where over here is more of the range of the light microscope. Most plant and animal cells, um, it's hard to see bacteria um, up close, but you can definitely see some bacterial strains on uh, with a light microscope. You can see a frog egg with the human eye. I actually worked with frogs for um, a few years, and I know that frog eggs are very easy to manipulate. You don't need a microscope uh, to study them. So a couple of terms uh, you should know about, mag about microscopy are magnification, resolution, and contrast. So magnification is simply the ratio between the size of an image and its actual size. And depending on the type of microscope, you can magnify an object um, from tens of times to hundreds of thousands of times. Resolution is the minimum distance between two objects that allows them to be seen as two separate objects. So take a second to think about what that means. But something with high resolution um, would be able, would allow you to distinguish things a lot better. So for example, a microscope with poor resolution might allow a student to see just one cell because it looks like a blob. Um, but if you have a better microscope with greater resolution, you might be able to resolve that those are actually two cells. And contrast is the difference in shading of an object compared to its background. And it's very hard to get contrast in a cell because things aren't colored naturally. Uh, things are very watery. So what you'll see in the book is often um, artificially labeled and colored. And that could be done with fluorescently tagged antibodies that target specific proteins. And they light up a given color when they find that protein. And you can take a picture of cells that way. And um, that's a technique called immunofluorescence. And you might learn more about that in a, an advanced biology class. In this image, you can see three images. In this, you can see three different pictures of this bird. This one has high contrast and high resolution. This one has low resolution because it's right. You can't see the fine details, but it still has high contrast because you can pick out the bird from the back, the background. And here you have very low contrast. It's very hard to pick out the object from the background, but you still do see um, fine details and you can see the separate objects. You can see the separate feathers, for example, where you cannot overhear. So there are two different types of electron microscopes I want you to be familiar with. The first is called a transmission electron microscope or a TEM. And that's used to visualize internal cell structures. So this is a cross section over here. This is TEM. And the way it works is it transmits electrons um, right through cells. 
Um, the book, I would like for you to read the book. There's a little excerpt in, I believe it's figure 4A, that talks about uh, the different types of microscopes. Um, it's on page 60. But you should be just at least know it's on these slides. So a TEM works by electrons passing through the specimen. And this is what you get as a cross section. It's like if you cut something in a cross section. This is, you can remember, um, like if you cut a bagel, that's a cross section. You're looking at it across. It's like a slice. And TEM can resolve all objects 500,000 times better than the human eye. So that's quite um, remarkable. So you can see many different things um, like organelles and uh, the cross section of cells, of whole small cells, very in a lot of resolution, high resolution using TEM. Another type of electron microscope is a scanning electron microscope, SEM. And you can remember S for surface because it helps reveal details on the surfaces of cells. And the specimen has to be first coated with a thin layer of metal and then electrons are bounced off of that surface. And the electrons are then, that bounce off are then detected on a screen um, and then an image is taken. So here you can see a euglena um, over here, and this is actually a surface. You can see the 3D surface of the euglena cell. So this is um, pretty remarkable over here. So on uh, this last slide, I want you to understand that a light microscope has a lot of limitations compared to a um, SEM. Right, so SEM, you're looking at details, very fine details. Um, this is a paramecium, and you can see all the different cilia, those little hairs. And then compare that to this. This is what you get from a light microscope. This is the same type of paramecium. So light microscopes have a lot less magnifying power than electron microscopes. Um, they don't use electrons, they use light. Um, and light is transmitted through a specimen. The benefit of a light microscope is that you can view living cells. So electron microscopes, um, you have to kill the cells and prepare them in a very special way. So with a light microscope, you can actually view the cells. Um, and this is a good comparison of euglena, um, of how you could see three different, um, three possible different ways to look at uh, this organism. So here you have a light micrograph at 200 X. So that's magnify 200 times. And you're going to be doing a lab using a uh, compound light microscope. So that's what you would be doing in a normal biology lab. You'd be looking at organisms using a light microscope and you'd see something like this. Um, if you were doing this for a profession, then you could use electron microscopes. And uh, so you, this is 1500 times magnified. Uh, you can see the surface of this euglena. And then over here, this is 12,000 times magnified. You can see the cross section of the euglena using TEM. So you should just know the basics of that. So cells vary greatly in size. And that's another thing about cells. Um, all living things are made of cells, but cells are really different from each other. And just as a starting point, uh, prokaryotes like bacteria and archaea are 10 times smaller in diameter than most plant and animal cells. So most plant and animal cells are in this range of 10 to 100 micrometers. This mic, this little U looking thing is micro. It's a micron symbol. So 10 micrometers to 100 micrometers is the average diameter of plant and animal cells. And you should know that. You really, if you really, it's 10 to 30-ish. Um, 10 to 30 micrometers is the average animal cell. Bacteria and archaea are about one to 10 micrometers in diameter. So 10 times smaller. But you can have some cells that are really large, right? They're like one millimeter, like a frog egg, like I mentioned before. So there's a really good video. Um, I'm going to pause here. Um, I want you to navigate to this um, link. And I'm going to show you um, a little bit of it now, but I want you to do it on your own just to understand uh, cell size and scale. So here I am on this uh, simulation. And what you can do is use the slider to gradually zoom in on various small objects. 
So as a starting point, let's try to orient your eyes to this is Times New Roman font on a piece of paper. So if you're looking at your textbook, try to look at that. Um, and what we're going to do is gradually zoom in little by little. So you can try to understand just how small some of these things are that we're going to talk about today. So that's Times New Roman. Here's a coffee bean. So here's a grain of rice. And here's a sesame seed. Uh, we're about to see a grain of salt. So that kind of looks right, like a grain of salt. And there we have our first cell, a very large amoeba and paramecia. And here's the first, one of the largest human cells is a human egg. So that's one of the exceptions of something that's larger than 100 micrometers. And now we start seeing, here's like the average skin cells, 30 micrometers. There's a red blood cell, it's eight micrometers. Here's the X chromosome, it's made of DNA mostly. A yeast cell. There we have our first prokaryotic um, cell, a bacteria. It's about six micrometers. Oh, sorry, 0. 0.6 micrometers, so it's under one micron. Uh, a lysosome is a part of a cell we'll discuss today. Mitochondria look awfully similar in size to a bacterium. Keep that in mind. And now we get to the virus level. So these are nanometers, billionths of meters. Uh, we can see the influenza virus, uh, HIV, the hepatitis virus, so very, very small. This is a, a bacteriophage, a type of uh, virus that infects bacteria. And here, this is the common cold, rhinovirus. Here we have a ribosome, which are machines that make proteins, like we'll talk about. And these are proteins themselves, like an antibody or hemoglobin. And then we're zooming even more, we have the building blocks of life, like lipids, sugars, nucleic acids, or amino acids. And then finally, we have the atomic level, the carbon atom at picometers. So now we're going to zoom out. Now we're at the nanometer scale. Now we're at the, the 10 nanometers. Or about 100 nanometers. Now we're at one micrometer. Now here are our first cells. Wow, there's our grain of salt again. So look how much smaller, that's a skin cell compared to a grain of salt. Again, think about the grain of salt and that's one of your skin cells and that's one of your red blood cells. And that's a little bacteria that are inside of you right now and it's probably on you. Okay, so that's enough of that for now but hopefully that gives you a sense of just how small things are and why are cells so small? So without going into too much detail, the book goes into a lot of detail about it. Uh, cells need a large surface area. So the smaller cells are, the larger the surface area can be. Um, and that means that there's more area of membrane to exchange materials, right? If you have more surface area, more, um, area around the cell, you can have more rapid exchange of materials in and out um, more quickly. So the surface area to volume ratio requires that cells be small, right? In order to have a lot of surface area, it actually benefits to have smaller cells compared to one large cell, right? You wouldn't be able to exchange as, mu as much material. You wouldn't be able to um, have as much communication. But if you divide the cells up smaller and smaller, you can maximize uh, their ability to communicate with each other um, and it maximizes their ability to transport materials in and out of the cell. Right, So it's advantageous uh, to exchange molecules in smaller cells. So this is important. All cells have certain common features regardless of their size and their type. All cells have genetic material at one point. There's exceptions like a red blood cell does not actively have uh, a nucleus when it's um, mature. So there are some exceptions to everything in science, but for the most part, all cells have DNA, all cells have ribosomes, which make proteins. 
And again, let's look at these pictures for whether you're a bacterial cell or you have eukaryotic cell. You have nucleic acids, you have ribosomes, you have a cell membrane, and you have something on the inside called the cytoplasm. All cells, regardless of size and type, carry out chemical reactions needed to sustain life. So for example, all cells use cellular respiration to make ATP. All cells utilize the same amino acids to make proteins on ribosomes. But we know that we can divide um, all living things into three domains of life, right? And we said some features are common to all three domains, like the membrane, nucleic acids, ribosomes, but others are found in only one domain. And it's important that you know how to distinguish the three domains. So we know that, um, for example, bacteria are prokaryotes. They do not have a nucleus and they do not have any organelles. Archaea are also prokaryote, prokaryotic. They have uh, no nucleus, no organelles, um, and they're also under 10 micrometers in size. Eukaryotes, however, are have uh, they have organelles and a nucleus, and they're about 10 to 100 micrometers in size. So that's just a brief um, overview. So we said all cells have membranes, and those membranes are all made of phospholipids. And we spoke about phospholipids in the last chapter as a building block of life. It's a special type of lipid. And all cells are mostly water and they live in aqueous or watery environments. And all cells have a cell membrane that separates them from the external environment. So this is an example of a membrane that's consisting of two layers of phospholipids, also known as a phospholipid bilayer, right? Bilayer means two layers. So this is a phospholipid bilayer and water is on the inside and water is on the outside. And this is very important um, because we remember that uh, phospholipids themselves have two components. They have a hydrophilic head and two hydrophobic fatty acid tails. And in fact, right, the polar hydrophilic head is the part that always interacts with the water on the outside of the cell or the inside. The bilayer is arranged as such because you have the two fatty acid tails making this big fatty layer on the inside. And we'll see why that's really important to keep all the fatty acid tails grouped together. Um, whereas the hydrophilic polar phospholipid heads are facing the outside, which is watery and facing the inside, which is watery. So the membrane itself is selectively permeable. That's a key word, right? And I'm going to use the word plasma membrane and cell membrane interchangeably. They're used interchangeably um, in the book. So the plasma or cell membrane functions as a selective barrier, right? It's selective that allows the passage of oxygen, nutrients, and also wastes um, throughout the cell. And we'll talk a lot more about this um, in the next chapter that talks all about the membrane, but lipids and small nonpolar molecules can easily cross the membrane. So steroids um, and small fatty molecules, small uh, fatty, um, small hydrophobic amino acids, so certain things can cross. Um, amino acids actually might be too big, but polar molecules and ions cannot get inside themselves. So that's very important. If you're polar, you cannot get inside the cell without help. So ions, which have charge, are in the same category. They cannot get through this fatty um, hydrophobic layer, as we'll soon see. So small hydrophobic molecules can enter freely into the cell. Hydrophilic molecules, which are polar, need help from membrane proteins to enter the cell. Membrane proteins I'll talk a lot about um, on the next slide and in the future. Um, but first, let's remind ourselves just again how this um, membrane is oriented, this phospholipid bilayer. And these fatty acid tails make this hydrophobic core. Um, so polar things cannot just cross through it. So it's a little bit like a bread and butter sandwich. So I took this out of a book I read years ago. Um, and I think it's a really good example. Um, so here's a bread and butter sandwich. And normally 
how can a hydrophilic substance enter the cell? So a hydrophilic substance is water is one that interacts with water, like food coloring. So food coloring dissolves in water. And if I had a big bread and butter sandwich, if I tried to put food coloring on one side, it would not be able to cross the hydrophobic butter, right? Butter is a lipid. It's a saturated fat. So saturated fats are made up of triglycerides. Those are very hydrophobic. So this hydrophilic food dye cannot interact with that hydrophobic uh, material. So it's not going to be allowed in um, into the rest of the sandwich. Enter membrane proteins. So membrane proteins help transmit information from the outside of the cell in. And there are several, several, several different types of membrane proteins. Um, there's hundreds of hundreds of different ones, and each has a different function. Um, I'll give you an example of one type of membrane protein. They're like olives. And olives without their pits. So these are like pitted olives. So if I put an olive without a pit inside of my bread and butter sandwich, then hydrophilic dyes can go from one side of the cell inside. So certain proteins act like olives. Those are membrane channels um, and they're embedded within the membrane. So it allows hydrophilic substances um, from outside to enter the cell. And again, these are not just channels that stay open all the time necessarily. These are under tight regulation. They're, they're very highly controlled. So that's an example of like transporter membrane proteins. Um, and this double gray thing is representing the phospholipid bilayer. So these are, um, and these are proteins, different membrane proteins that are embedded within the membrane. Some are enzymes, some act as anchors, um, so cells can hold on to each other. Some act as receptors. Those are very important, and I'm going to talk about those now. So every one of your cells is coated with receptors on the cell membrane. So every single cell that your body has in you right now is covered in membrane proteins that are waiting for certain signals from outside of your body and from inside of your body. And I like to think about the membrane as the brain of the cell. So sometimes the nucleus is said to be the brain of the cell, and I think that's incorrect, um, right? We just said uh, a red blood cell can survive without a nucleus. So clearly if the, if the nucleus is like the brain, um, you can't live without a brain. So the nucleus is not really like the brain. The nucleus contains genetic information and that's important. Um, it's critical for a cell to have its instructions to hold its DNA. But what's more like the brain is the cell membrane and all of its receptor proteins. And here's the phospholipid bilayer. And again, this is like one uh, cartoon animation of one such receptor that's just waiting for something to bind to it. And when a signaling molecule binds to this receptor, there's going to be a whole lot of things that happen on the inside of the cell that can cause some cellular change on the DNA level, or it can activate some enzymes. Um, so this is the way that uh, we, the insides of our body, right, communicate with each other is through uh, receptor proteins. And this is called signal transduction. And this is one of the most beautiful aspects of biology that you can learn about, and it gets very detailed. Um, so in reality, what can be just one little small um, channel, like this is one olive, for example, that allows calcium in, right? So that's one olive that's embedded in the membrane. Normally, calcium is charged. It can't just enter the cell. Um, so how is the cell supposed to know that calcium is outside? Right. Well, there's a special place for calcium and only calcium will be allowed in. And when calcium enters the cell, a whole lot of things will happen. So this is just a glimpse of our understanding right now. And as a cell biologist, you have to memorize a lot of these pathways, as they're called. They're called signaling pathways. You do not have to know any of these in this class. Um, but just as an example, when the cell finally detects some calcium, that activates a protein called PKC. PKC could then activate other proteins like RAS. RAS is a G protein that usually is on the membrane. RAS can then activate a protein called RAF, which can activate a protein called MEC, which can activate a protein called ERK, 
which will go into the nucleus and turn on different genes. Those genes can then be made into proteins, and those proteins can then do something in the cell. They can be transported out of the cell, all res in response to that little calcium. And remember, calcium cannot have gotten inside by itself. It's only because of these membrane proteins, right, that calcium was allowed allowed to communicate um, with the cell. And that's why I think about this membrane, like these different membrane proteins as like the brain. Because what the brain does is it looks for signals, right? Whether they're scent signals, they're sight, sound, right? Those are stimuli. And our brain perceives those stimuli and tells us what's going on. But just as importantly, the brain acts as a filter, right? It not only receives, it also filters and it blocks out unnecessary information. So for example, right now I'm focusing. My brain is trying my best, it's trying its best to focus and not think about what's going on outside and not thinking about what I'm eating for dinner because that's not relevant. Right now I have to give a lecture. So right now I need to be focused on biology. And my brain is acting like a filter, just like this membrane is. This membrane is blocking out anything that the cell does not need right now, right? Unless you're needed right now in this given moment, the membrane is going to protect that from entering the cell. So that's the importance and the beauty of the membrane, right? B-R-A-I-N, the membrane. Also crucial to cells communicating with each other are carbohydrates that come out of the cell membrane. So sugar molecules are attached to some of these proteins, like these olives, right? That's like, I keep on calling them olives, but they're just proteins and they're embedded. They're integral proteins. They're integrated in the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, and these sugars are important for cells to recognize each other and to communicate. The cell membrane also has steroids, um, and that helps the membrane uh, be the right consistency, meaning the right level of fluidity, not too soft, not too rigid. And uh, cholesterol is an example of a steroid uh, that is found in all of our cell membranes and every single um, cell membrane in your body. And it's important to recognize that the cell membrane is not a solid. It's more of a fluid um, it, like a jello, if anything. That's how I would compare it. It's like a jello. And things are always moving around. So it's hard to um, see here. It's a 2D image. But this is um, a very fluid, dynamic place in a cell. And these phospholipids can actually flip around and switch places. Proteins can move around and diffuse in and out. Um, and because there are so many different components so many different pieces and parts to the um, cell membrane, but yet these parts are moving. The cell membrane is referred to as a fluid mosaic. So the fluid mosaic model um, describes how the cell membrane is a collection of different parts, like a mosaic is, but yet it's not solid. It's a fluid mosaic. So I'm gonna um, play this video for you now. Um, I think it's a very good video that gives you an orientation of the membrane. And again, the next chapter talks exclusively about the cell membrane. These materials move in and out of cells by passing through the plasma membrane of the cell. The plasma membrane surrounds the cell and separates the interior of the cell from its environment. This semi-permeable membrane is composed of a lipid bilayer. Phospholipids make up a large part of the membrane and form a bilayer. The structure of the bilayer is due to the tail-to-tail -tail packing of the nonpolar hydrophobic tails composed of two fatty acid chains and the polar hydrophilic heads composed of glycerol and phosphorylated alcohol. The lipid bilayer is 5 to 10 nanometers thick and is embedded with proteins. Some cell membranes also contain cholesterol. A plasma membrane contains different types of proteins which are specific to the particular function of the cell. These proteins also enable the cell to interact with its environment. The entire structure of the plasma membrane can be described as a fluid mosaic model. The phospholipid bilayer has properties resembling fluids and the differing proteins and their attachments on either side of the membrane resemble a mosaic.
Great. So hopefully that helped uh, introduce you to the cell membrane. So read this question and pause here. So the answer is D, small nonpolar molecules. Now read this question and pause here. The answer is A. So now another feature that all cells have in common, in addition to the plasma membrane, are, are ribosomes. And ribosomes are cellular machines that make proteins. Remember, proteins are made up of amino acids. Um, so since that's a building block of life, all living things need proteins, all cells have ribosomes. And the ribosome itself is made up of a certain kind of ribonucleic acid called ribosomal RNA or rRNA and also proteins. So it's roughly about two thirds of RNA and one third protein. And it's actually the RNA that's the enzyme part. And that's really um, unusual in, um, I should say, overall in biology, most enzymes are proteins. Uh, the ribosome is an example of a ribozyme, which is an enzyme that's made up of RNA. That's a little more detail than you need to know. What I want you to know is that all cells have ribosomes, and ribosomes can be found in one of two places in a eukaryote. Ribosomes could be floating around in the cell um, if they're making proteins for the cytoplasm, or they can be found on the rough endoplasmic reticulum called or abbreviated the RER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum of eukaryotes. So ribosomes are the cell's protein factories, and you can either be a free ribosome hanging out in the cytoplasm, or right outside of the nucleus of a eukaryote, you can find the rough endoplasmic reticulum that is studded with ribosomes. And under a microscope, it looks rough, and that's why it's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. More on that later. Um, I want to talk about bacteria cells briefly and kind of get them out of the way. No disrespect to them. They've been around a lot longer than we have, um, but they're not as interesting. And this class will focus mostly on eukaryotes. So bacteria are prokaryotic. Prokaryotes do not have any organelles. Make sure that's underlined in your notes. Um, bacteria do not have any organelles and neither do archaea. Um, they do have ribosomes to make proteins and they do have DNA to encode the proteins. And those are kind of floating around. The DNA is, uh, is localized in a nucleoid region of uh, a prokaryote. The ribosomes are just floating around to the cytoplasm. They, uh, bacteria have a special type of cell wall made of peptidoglycans. So it's like a combination of uh, protein and sugar. Um, peptido, you can think about peptide, like protein, and glyco, like sugar, so uh, protein, sugar, cell wall, um, outside of their cell membrane. So in uh, yellow, you can see the cell membrane, but in purple is the specialized cell wall. And this, um, the bacteria also has a capsule. And this, again, they're made of sugars and, and proteins that help bacteria um, recognize each other and um, also interact with the world around them, right? So they have different receptors on their surfaces as well. And that's how bacteria can sort of see, quote unquote, hear and, and taste what's going on. Bacteria come in three main shapes. They can be rod shaped like bacillus, uh, they can be spherical, caucus, or they can be spiral. Um, and there's two, they could be spirulum. Uh, so these look a little more uh, uh, firm. These are more rigid. Or uh, spirochetes are fl flexible. And this is like one of these spirals here. This is a rod-shaped bacillus. And here you can see the spherical caucus. And again, note the size is about one micrometer in diameter. So that was what I need you to know for prokaryotic cells. Um, there's some more information in the book. 
Um, you should understand that bacteria are incredibly diverse. They could do photosynthesis. They could survive in any atmosphere, um, just, like, just like archaea, actually. And if you were to study microbiology, you would only really uh, study prokaryotes and viruses and stuff like that. Um, but this is an overview. So we'll focus mostly on eukaryotic cells and animal cells, uh, fungi and plant cells are all eukaryotes. Um, what's characteristic of all eukaryotic cells is DNA contained within a nucleus. So here we can see the nucleus of a cell. This is an animal cell up here. This is a plant cell down here. You can see um, it's a little different, but they both have a nucleus and that nucleus has DNA. They also have several different organelles that are each membrane bounded, meaning each organelle is separated by phospholipid membranes. Um, and why do you think that's important? So why do you, what's the benefit of having different compartments in a cell compared to a prokaryote where everything is kind of hung, um, floating around? Right. So you have a lot more organization. Um, and you can kind of divide and conquer and do a lot more specialized tasks if you have separate regions, separate compartments that are protected. So you can control each environment um, so to, to do one type of thing. And you can divide and conquer a lot of different tasks to make the functioning of a cell a lot more efficient. Uh, compared to a bacteria cell, everything is floating around. Not much can, uh, can happen at once. Not much complexity can really happen. Uh, so you can think about it like a, a company um, and an office building that has different departments and they have an HR department and they have an office place and they have a kitchen, they have uh, a copy station, they have all these different, and a lounge and a cafeteria. They have a lot of different compartments so they can function like a company. Uh, you can't really have a company if you just have one room. If you have the cafeteria next to all the office buildings, next to the, the, uh, the computers, next to the CEO, um, this wouldn't work. Um, or it would work, but not very complex, right? It wouldn't be very complex functioning. So eukaryotic cells are specialized because they have so many different organelles. Each organelle has a separate internal environment that allows it to do something unique. And as a rule, if it has a nucleus, it's a eukaryote. So follow along with your book. Um, as I go through these slides and in your notes, I recommend having a table um, that looks like this. So you have a list of all the cell structures or organelles we'll talk about. Talk about where is it located roughly, what the functions are, what it looks like, and what cell types it's found in. Is it found in bacteria cells, plant cells, or animal cells? And a very, very, very helpful thing I would suggest you do, it's worth taking the extra 10 minutes to do this, is make a Venn diagram with three circles, one with animal cells, plant cells, and bacteria cells. And you should be able to take all the different organelles and cell structures we discussed this class and put them in their proper category. So for example, if something is shared by animal cells, bacteria cells, and plant cells, you would put it in the middle in this overlapping section. So what would go there? So you would put ribosomes, cell membrane, cytoplasm, DNA, right? Those are the commonalities of all three. What is found in animal cells and plant cells, but not bacteria cells? So what can go here? A nucleus, right? Those are both eukaryotes. So again, you should be able to uh, make a cell Venn diagram in your notes. Um, it's very helpful uh, to study from. Another little lesson I want to kind of illustrate is that eukaryotic cells are like many humans uh, and all the organelles are like our organs. So what are the major functions of the body? Uh, pause the video here and make a list of all the different functions of the body. What does a body need to do in order to live? So pause here and I'm going to show you my list, right? We have to eat, bodies move, we need energy, we digest, we grow, we die, we reproduce, we evolve and change. We need to protect ourselves, defend ourselves, seek shelter. Um, we need to communicate. And interestingly, um, for each function of the human body, 
there's a corresponding part of the cell that does that at the cellular level. So in order for a cell to eat, right, there are vacuoles. For cells to move, there's a cytoskeleton. For cells to have energy, there's a mitochondria. Digestion doesn't happen in the stomach. It happens in the lysosome, right? And so on and so on. So you could really um, make an analogy of each organelle to an organ system in the human body. And it's a good way to start conceptualizing some of these things. And your brain will absorb this information a lot better if you come up with examples on your own, right? So when we talk about the lysosome, think of it like the stomach. Um, and that will help your brain retain that information and it will make it a little more enjoyable um, for you to go through this learning process. So what is false about prokaryotes? Pause here. So A is false. So something um, in addition to organelles is cytosol that are inside of the cell. So the cytoplasm refers to the entire inside of the cell. Um, so organelles are in the cytoplasm and cytosol is outside of the organelles. So the cytosol is a gel of proteins and small molecules. So like a jelly type material um, that's shown in blue here. And then the organelles we said perform critical functions in each cell. Those are the colored um, different shapes. And each organelle has its own membrane um, that protects it from the outside cytosol. So again, this means polar molecules cannot just enter cells, uh, enter organelles, just like they can't enter cells. There's a lot of control about what can get in each, in and out of each organelle. So again, inside of every, th every membrane, every plasma membrane is cytoplasm. And cytoplasm equals organelles plus cytosol, the gel. So now I'm going to introduce you to um, a few main classes of organelles. The endomembrane system uh, we'll talk about first. And the endomembrane system includes organelles that transport materials within the cell and, with, and out of the cell. So it's all about transport. Um, the endoplasmic reticulum is involved. Also the Golgi apparatus and vesicles. These guys transport materials in and out of the cell. Also part of the endomembrane system is an organelle that breaks down molecules and disposes of waste like the lysosome. So together, um, these organelles make up the endomembrane system to kind of transport materials, get rid of it as necessary. So import, export, um, and recycling. We also have microbodies. We'll only talk about one really in this class. And those are organelles that have specialized enzymes inside that perform specific functions or they store chemicals, store materials of sorts. So the peroxisome is an organelle that has special enzymes and the vacuole is um, a organelle that has uh, the ability to store energy molecules and other, um, other macromolecules. And these are examples of microbodies. Finally, there are energy related organelles that capture or store energy. Um, in animal cells, we have mitochondria and in plants, they also have chloroplasts. So remember, producers um, don't need to consume energy. So they can produce their own energy using a chloroplast. And energy-related organelles are both um, independently derived. I'll talk about what that means more. And then they're pretty self-sufficient. So they have their own DNA. They have their own division cycle. Um, they, have, they do their own thing um, compared to the rest of the cell. So the nucleus, again, a critical function, a critical aspect of all eukaryotic cells is the nucleus and that controls protein production. So over the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about um, what's referred to as the central dogma of biology. And this says that the DNA specifies the recipe for proteins um, in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. So prokaryotes have a single circular chromosome 
of DNA that's floating around in the nucleoid region. However, eukaryotic cells store DNA in the nucleus. And the nuclear membrane protects the eukaryotic nucleus, but has pores that allow materials in and out. So true or false, every nucleus in your body has the same DNA. Every nucleus in your body has the same DNA, the same instructions. Is that true or false? So that is very largely true. Every single cell in your body has the same DNA, except for our gametes, technically. Our sperm and egg cells um, do a mixing and matching of DNA, so they're not all alike, and they actually have half the amount of genetic material as your um, other body cells. Um, but all of your body cells have the same DNA. Yep, your skin cells, your muscle cells, your hair cells, your eye cells all have the same exact DNA. Um, and we'll talk about why cells are different um, in chapter 13, which talks about gene expression. Um, so we'll talk about uh, genes a lot more um, in the second half of the class. But the, we'll talk about the nucleus now a little bit more. This is the nucleus. Here's the nice, it's, a very, it's the biggest organelle. It's the most prominent organelle. The inside is called the nucleoplasm. There's a region inside called the nucleolus, and that's where ribosomes are built. And DNA is stored as chromatin. So DNA is kind of unraveled. Um, it doesn't look like chromosomes as you would see it normally drawn. Um, it only looks like chromosomes when the cell is in a certain phase of division. Normally, DNA is stored as chromatin, which is like a loose yarn. And I could talk a lot more about that, but we're going to have to wait until a later chapter to talk about DNA and chromatin. For now, I want to briefly discuss the central dogma of biology, which begins in the nucleus of eukaryotes. And the central dogma of biology will be covered in detail in chapter 12. Um, but the central dogma of biology begins in the nucleus, and that's what we're discussing now is the nucleus. And like I mentioned, the nucleus contains DNA, which specifies the recipes for different proteins needed in the entire organism. So we have over 20,000 different recipes that make hundreds of thousands of different proteins. So even one recipe um, can later be modified to create different proteins from one DNA recipe. Uh, the example I'll give you, um, just when I, we're talking very basic here. Um, central dogma of biology, because I think it's going to help illustrate some of these endomembrane system organelles. So this example I'm going to give you is the example of lactation. And in lactation, milk proteins and other milk fats have to be packaged and delivered to milk duct ducts so a baby can nurse and be nourished. So all mammals have this in common. All mammals synthesize milk proteins and milk lipids and mammary cells, right? All female, um, all female mammals have milk ducts that deliver this milk and in response to certain hormones. Um, and again, those hormones um, after birth, at the, at the birth of a, of, a, of a baby, there are hormones that, simul that stimulate the production of milk. Um, and this milk has to be delivered from outside of the cell and delivered to milk ducts. So how does that milk get made and how does it get out of the cell so it can get to the baby? So let's go very back to the beginning. The milk has to be made. So how does milk get made? There has to be a recipe for the milk protein. So this milk protein recipe, the recipe for how to make milk protein is in every single cell. But only the mammary cells will be told to start rewriting this recipe for milk protein into messenger RNA. It's called mRNA. It's a close chemical cousin of DNA. It matches the sequence of DNA. And the mRNA, the messenger RNA, will carry the protein recipe for the milk protein um, through a nuclear pore, right? The nuclear envelope has these pores and it will go into the cytoplasm. 
Once it's in the cytoplasm, that RNA, that mRNA will find a ribosome on the rough endoplasmic reticulum and protein will be made from that recipe. So the ribosomes can follow the recipes and put together amino acids to make proteins. Um, we said some uh, ribosomes float around in the cytosol, in the cytoplasm. However, if the protein has to be delivered to a specific location, the mRNA will find a ribosome on the endoplasmic reticulum. So here we could see this mRNA is finding a ribosome on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And what happens is the amino acids are being assembled inside the endoplasmic reticulum. And the amino acids are folding into a specific shape inside of here. And once the protein is made, we're going to see how the protein uh, gets shifted through the endomembrane system, right, as it gets modified and sorted, and finally transported out of the cell. So that endoplasmic reticulum is a network of membranes that borders the nucleus and extends throughout the cell. So here's the endoplasmic reticulum of uh, an animal cell. And if the endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on it, it's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum is a site of protein synthesis, since it has ribosomes on it, and also protein modification. So inside the endoplasmic reticulum, there are tons of enzymes that can modify proteins, can help them fold into their specific shape, um, can help add different um, things to them. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum overall is where proteins are modified and folded into their exact perfect 3D conformation. Um, there's another type of endoplasmic reticulum that's called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it's called smooth because there's, there's no ribosomes on it. So if there's no ribosomes, that means it's smooth, and there is no protein synthesis on the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. There's only lipid synthesis. So lipids get made on the smooth ER. Proteins get made on the rough ER. So that's, so smooth ER makes lipids. Rough ER makes proteins because it has ribosomes on it. Proteins from the rough endoplasmic reticulum and lipids from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum are all packaged in little bubbles of membrane called vesicles. So vesicles are little bubbles of phospholipid membrane. Um, I'll show you a picture. This is a little vesicle over here. So here's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then here is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So here, some of those milk fats, those lipids and milk will be um, packaged in these vesicles. So that's where we are so far. Nucleus, DNA, mRNA, through the nuclear pore, ribosome on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum where lipids are made. And here we have nice vesicles of protein and fats. Um, this is a little side point because proteins that are in the endomembrane system get snaked through in a way. So here's this ribosome um, and here's mRNA. So normally, if the protein is needed inside of the cytoplasm, it doesn't even need to go to the endoplasmic reticulum. The mRNA can find a ribosome inside of the cytosol and just make the protein right then and there. But um, if the protein is needed inside of an organelle or outside of the cell, like in the case of the, the milk protein, the ribosome is on the endoplasmic reticulum and the protein gets made inside here. So where are ribosomes found? Pause here. The answer is D, either floating in the cytosol or the rough ER. So going back to our story, after the lipids and the proteins were packaged in vesicles, the vesicles fuse with the Golgi apparatus, which is right over here, which is a kind of sack, a stack of membrane sacs. And this is a processing center 
for all of the um, all the proteins and lipids that get made um, from the endoplasmic reticula. So the Golgi is a processing center. So from the beginning, let's go from the beginning. Um, number one, milk protein genes were copied into RNA. The mRNA left through the nuclear pore. It found a ribosome at the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the information in the mRNA was used to produce the milk proteins. The enzymes in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum made lipids, which are yellow spheres, and these were packaged and fused um, with the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus um, will process and package the proteins for export. So the Golgi apparatus can recognize the proteins and lipids that are sent to it, and it kind of determines where it's supposed to go. And it will, again, sort and package them into unique vesicles um, that will then know where to go. So the Golgi apparatus up close looks like a bunch of flattened sacs. And the function of the Golgi is to modify proteins made on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it then directs them to their proper cellular destination. You could think about it like a post office person. So after the protein gets made, the Golgi apparatus acts like a post person by sorting the vesicles for shipment. It can look at the contents of the vesicle and say, oh, okay, your milk proteins, you belong outside of the cell. I'm gonna just add a special chemical to you, like a post stamp almost, that tells the cell where to send it. And that vesicle that has those milk proteins in it will then be sent outside of the cell. Um, it's called exocytosis, outside exocytosis, the cell. Um, so proteins could be sent outside of the cell, or let's say the proteins are needed in a certain organelle. The Golgi apparatus will recognize that and say, okay, you belong in this organelle, I'm gonna send you there. So vesicles are either exported from the cell, right? It's called secretion or exocytosis, or they can be transported to organelles within a cell, right? Proteins need to be uh, inside of the organelles for them to function. Also, let's say you're a membrane protein. The Golgi apparatus can recognize that, and then it will fuse with the membrane itself. It won't leave the membrane. It will be fused with the membrane and become a membrane protein, like an olive. So finally, those packaged, sorted, modified proteins are destined to be secreted from the cell. So the proteins and lipids are released when the vesicles fuse with the cell membrane in a process called exocytosis. And a critical feature of the endomembrane system, and the only reason why it can really work, is that all of them have phospholipid membranes that can fuse together. So these membranes of, that contain uh, proteins and lipids can go from one organelle to the next and outside of the cell because they're all made of the same type of phospholipids. So this is a good time, uh, actually not yet, uh, to pause. Let's do lysosomes first, and then it's, I'll tell you it's a good time to pause. Um, lysosomes are still considered part of the endomembrane system, and I like to think about them as the garbage disposal of the cell, kind of like your stomach. And just like your stomach, the lysosome contains enzymes that break down cellular components by hydrolysis. That should ring a bell. What is hydrolysis? My hydrolysis is a type of reaction that breaks up uh, molecules into smaller parts. And lysosomes are not commonly found in plants. So when you think about lysosomes, think about animal cells. Any cell waste in the cell, any garbage in the cell, is packaged in vesicles and then sent to the lysosome for destruction. So over here, um, this picture is some cell debris that's being internalized from the outside of the cell. This is called endocytosis, by the way. We'll talk about that next time. It's being internalized by the cell and sent to the lysosome, where the lysosome is gonna break up that debris and release um, all those byproducts so they can be recycled and rebuilt into something useful. Just like the stomach, a very acidic environment is critical for the lysosome to function. 
that means, actually, you tell me, does that mean low pH or high pH? Right, it's very low pH. Um, does that mean high concentration of H plus or low concentration of H plus? The lysosome has a very high concentration of H plus, very acidic environment, very low pH, just like the stomach. Um, and that's critical for all of the, all the hydrolytic enzymes to function. So hydrolysis, right, means breaking by water. Um, so enzymes break all the bonds in these big macromolecules in the lysosome. So the lysosome is like the garbage disposal, the cell that chops everything up. And the lysosome um, itself is, is made by the Golgi apparatus, essentially, um, because proteins, I mean, there are lysosomal proteins encoded in the DNA of all of our cells. Those enzymes get made and then get sent to, oops, sorry, get sent to the lysosome. So this is the Golgi apparatus that is processing these lysosomal enzymes. And there happens to be a special sugar added to all lysosomal enzymes. So the Golgi apparatus knows, send those enzymes to the lysosome. Send those to the lysosome. So the lysosome becomes an environment that has all these lysosomal enzymes. And it's very acidic. So it's like a stomach. And the cell has many lysosomes, so many little stomachs. And it's important that there's a membrane around the stomach because you don't want the outside environment to influence it, right? So you want to have a special compartment where only the garbage disposal can happen. Only the, the acidic environment would allow all this stuff to get chopped up. And like I mentioned, the enzymes that the lysosome relies on um, are all encoded by genes in the nucleus. And unfortunately, if you have a mutation in one of these, in one of those genes, that can give you some serious trouble. So Tay-Sachs is a genetic disorder. Um, a genetic disorder means there is a gene that is mutated. So the gene for hexoaminidase, which is an enzyme, um, is mutated. So that means that they don't have a functional hexoaminidase enzyme. Normally, the enzyme hexoaminidase breaks down um, lipids. It breaks down lipids. So all of us um, that do not have, that are lucky enough that, to not have Tay-Sachs have an enzyme called hexoaminidase that breaks down lipids for us. If you don't have that enzyme, there's going to be a backup of garbage, backup of lipids. So it's like clogging the garbage disposal. And in cells like neurons, if you get a backup of garbage, your neurons can't communicate properly with each other. And if neurons can't communicate properly with each other, your body can't function. So in uh, patients with Tay-Sachs disease, it's a very serious disorder. Um, you cannot live a long life with Tay-Sachs disease um, because you cannot have a lysosome to break down the cellular garbage and you cannot have garbage in your cells. So even if you have a damaged organelle, so once your mitochondria, which is a different type of organelle, gets damaged, the lysosome basically consumes it. It eats it. It's called autophagy, um, autophagy. It's like eating itself almost. Um, so this is a mitochondria and a different organelle called the peroxisome inside of a lysosome. So the lysosome gets rid of all cellular garbage and all damaged organelles. Make sure it's a nice, clean environment. So here is a little video about lysosomes. Um, it's also available on Connect. All these videos are mostly available on Connect. Lysosomes are membrane-bound vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. These enzymes degrade proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates. Lysosomes are formed by the Golgi apparatus within the cells. When particles such as viruses or bacteria are ingested by phagocytosis, the lysosome fuses with the particle containing vesicle, called a phagosome, and delivers the hydrolytic enzymes. Lysosomes also fuse with portions of cells, such as old mitochondria. This results in the destruction and recycling of these structures. So, very cool organelles we have there. So to summarize the endomembrane system, we begin with proteins 
made outside of the nucleus on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Those proteins are made by ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum that are then packaged um, into vesicles, right? Similarly, any lipids made by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum would be packaged into vesicles. Those vesicles fuse with the Golgi apparatus, which modifies the lipids and proteins from the endoplasmic reticula. It sorts and packages them to their proper cellular destination. So in this case, these proteins are destined for the outside of the cell. They're destined for secretion. So in a process called exocytosis, this uh, vesicle fuses with the membrane, with the plasma membrane, and all those protein products are released to the outside of the cell. We can also go on the other side. We can consume things. So let's say it's some waste um, that the cell needs to get rid of on the outside of the cell. We don't want any garbage on the outside of the cell. So the cell can consume this in a process called endocytosis. And that vesicle can fuse with the lysosome. And the lysosome contains enzymes that break down any substances that um, enter the cell that aren't wanted. And over here, you can see that enzymes, these hydrolytic enzymes from the Golgi apparatus, are you know, replenishing the supply in the lysosome. So the lysosome has a constant supply of fresh hydrolytic enzymes that can chop up things that we no longer want. So to summarize the endomembrane system, this is, should be, again, pretty. you have to review, review, review in order to get this drilled in your head. Proteins produced in the rough ER and lipids produced in the smooth ER are carried in vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus then modifies these um, products, these macromolecules, and sorts and packages them into vesicles that go to various cell destinations, whether it's an organelle, um, at the membrane, or outside of the cell. Some vesicles right, carry products from the Golgi to the cell membrane, where exocytosis releases materials from the cell. Lysosomes digest macromolecules in the cell, um, they can digest materials from incoming vesicles, from endocytosis, or they can digest whole organelles if they're damaged. And overall, organelles within the endomembrane system can interact because their membranes can fuse together. And of course, there are so many different special proteins and carbohydrates on organelles themselves and on the vesicles that allow them to communicate and interact with each other. So there's a whole interplay of how the vesicles know where to go um, and how organelles can understand which proteins they need. This is actually understood to some extent. Um, and if you're interested in this, then maybe you want to take an extra biology class. So moving on from the endomembrane system, we have the peroxisome, which is a type of microbody. And peroxisomes, like the lysosome, also aid in cell digestion. So it has a similar function to the lysosome. Uh, however, whereas the lysosome really focused on breaking down proteins, metabolizing proteins, the peroxisomes have enzymes that metabolize lipids. So fats are broken down in the peroxisomes. Um, there are also enzymes that detoxify other molecules. So the peroxisome is kind of like the liver because it breaks down fats and detoxifies things, detoxifies any poisons. And uh, so think about the lysosome like the stomach, but the peroxisome is like the liver. And peroxisomes are present in animal cells and plant cells. Remember, lysosomes are not commonly found in, in plant cells. And they're called peroxisomes because when they break down fats, they produce hydrogen peroxide. And that's actually bad news because peroxide is toxic. Hydrogen peroxide is a toxic substance. It could damage DNA. Um, if you're putting peroxide on your wounds, you should stop. Um, it's actually frowned upon um, now because we know that peroxide not only kills um, bacteria, it also kills you, your cells at least, or it can, it can mutate them. So it's not good to use peroxide. But luckily for us, in each of our peroxisomes, there's a lot of an enzyme called catalase. So this toxic peroxide gets broken down into harmless water and oxygen, 
by this enzyme called catalase that's also present inside of the peroxisomes. So again, the peroxisome's job is to break down fats. When it does that, it produces a toxin. That toxin is peroxide. Um, so peroxide gets broken down by catalase and the catalase uh, breaks down peroxide into water and oxygen. There is an interesting experiment you can do at home. If you see that, um, if you take any liver, I mean, if you go to the butcher and you get a piece of liver, liver has a lot of peroxisomes in it because its job is to break down fatty acids and to detoxify. So if you were to take a piece of liver and put it into a cup of peroxide, you would see rapid oxygen formation. You would see a lot of bubbles form. And that's because the catalase present in the liver is breaking down the hydrogen peroxide into oxygen gas and water. So it's a very um, interesting experiment you can do at home. Also, even uh, potatoes have an abundance of peroxisomes. So if you take a little cube of potato and put that in peroxide, you'll see it start to foam. Uh, peroxisomes um, must be functioning at all times because you don't want to have any uh, fatty acids accumulate. So defective peroxisomes may lead to severe mental impairments in humans, um, such as adrenal leukodystrophy, which is another genetic disorder um, called ALD. And that, <clears throat> be, um, because of those fatty acids accumulating, um, it can damage the white matter of the brain and uh, also the adrenal glands, which sit atop the kidneys. Uh, so this has um, devastating consequences and certain research is being um, conducted right now to try to figure out if we can repair the genes. Um, so there's no more ALD um, suffering at all. So that's um, that's the end of some of the, that's the end of the microbody um, conversation almost. We have one more microbody, it's called a, a vacuole. And Eukaryotes have vacuoles, but vacuoles are more associated with plant cells. <clears throat> so plant cells are also eukaryotic. They have the same kinds of organelles, but a couple of differences. The first is a vacuole, which is a type of microbody. So human, uh, humans, plants do not have lysosomes, but they do have a similar function in vacuoles. And they also have um, this feature that keeps them in their proper shape. So a vacuole takes up a lot of the space in a plant cell. And it's called the central vacuole because it's right in the center. So cellular digestion occurs here. So breakdown of, of garbage, of uh, anything that needs to be recycled, just like the lysosome, is going to happen in the vacuole of plants. But also the vacuole helps regulate the size of the plant cell and the water balance of the plant cell, All right? So the large central vacuole helps regulate the turgor pressure of plants. So um, try to imagine this is uh, the out plants have a cell wall on like animal cells, uh, which is very rigid. But in order for the cell to remain rigid and firm, you need to have the central vacuole filled with fluid. Um, so it will press against the cell wall and make sure that the plant is nice and upright. So when you see an upright plant, all the vacuoles, the central vacuoles are filled with water and that's what allows the cell wall to be, you know, fully um, rigid. So this plant is upright. However, if the vacuole is empty and runs out of water um, in response to either salty conditions or dry conditions, what will happen is the plant, uh, the cell walls will not be able to maintain their shape and the whole plant will wilt. So you're gonna therefore have to water the plant so the vacuoles can fill back up uh, with water. So that's the vacuole. So we now spoke about the endomembrane system, the nucleus, uh, the two microbodies, which are the peroxisomes and the vacuole. And now we'll talk about the energy related organelles, starting with the mitochondria which are found um, in plants and animal cells. So almost all eukaryotic cells have many, many mitochondria. Mitochondria have two unique membranes made of phospholipid bilayers, but they're a little different. So the outer membrane allows small molecules to pass through, just like the cell membrane. The inner membrane has a unique feature because that's where ATP is produced. And we said last time that ATP is the cell's source of energy. 
So all ATP is made on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is known to be the powerhouse of the cell because that's where ATP is made. So all the energy comes from the mitochondria. So you can imagine muscle cells have the most mitochondria. The inner membrane you can see here is folded over and over and over and over again. And those folds are referred to as Christi. So the folds are called Christi. So why do you think that's important? Right, you want to actually maximize the ATP production in this small little mitochondria. So by folding the membrane, the inner membrane over and over again, you're maximizing surface area. So you can maximize the ATP production in a tiny little organelle. Right, that's the theme is in increased surface area. You can maximize efficiency and transport and production. Inside of the inner membrane is called the matrix. And it kind of looks like a swimming pool in this picture. And in the matrix, there are special enzymes that can break glucose down. Glucose is a sugar. So sugar gets broken down in the matrix um, that helps convert it into energy. Um, mitochondria are unique because all of us get our mitochondria only from our mothers. So the sperm just contributes DNA. No organelles come from the sperm. The mother, the egg, um, has the mitochondria. So all the mitochondria that you have in your body came from um, your mother. So they're maternally inherited. And interestingly, mitochondria have their own DNA in them and their own ribosomes. So they don't rely on our nucleus or our ribosomes. They do their own thing. They divide completely separately um, from when our cells undergo mitosis. So here you can see um, a structure. This is a uh, a TEM structure, right? Transmission of electron microscopy. You can see a cross section of this. And here you can see the Christie are the folds, right? The matrix is on the inside. Um, and here you can see some ribosomes and some circular DNA, which is in the, uh, in the mitochondria. So a special reaction occurs in the mitochondria that's called cellular respiration and that's the process that extracts energy from food to make atp so cellular respiration is a very important process that we rely on every single second of our lives because it takes the glucose um, from the food we eat takes the oxygen from the air we breathe and it makes atp energy out of it we also um, make carbon dioxide which we exhale the way mitochondria produce ATP is by adding a special phosphate group, phosphate is phosphorus with oxygens, to a molecule of ADP versus a very high energy bond. So ADP has a little bit of energy, but when you add an extra phosphate, this becomes ATP, right? When you have three phosphates, tons of energy are stored in this last bond. And that's what makes ATP so powerful, is the energy stored in here. It makes it like a fully charged battery that's ready for functioning. So where in ATP is the most energy stored? So pause here. The answer is B. So plants and some al and algae contain chloroplasts. And chloroplasts are not found in animal cells. Um, and like mitochondria, chloroplasts also have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. There's actually a third type of membrane in chloroplasts um, called a thylakoid membrane. And it's in these thylakoids. Those are the discs. So these each individual disc is a thylakoid. <clears throat> and thylakoids have an abundance of um, a pigment called chlorophyll. And that's what allows energy to be converted from sunlight into sugars in the process of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis um, is done in the chloroplast. And that process of photosynthesis, photo means light. So we're using light from the sun to synthesize sugars for energy. Unfortunately, we do not have chloroplasts. 
So we cannot just sit in the sun and make sugar. We have to eat sugar. And that sugar gets broken down by our mitochondria. Um, but in chloroplasts, these are big, these are much larger than mitochondria. Um, chloroplasts can allow plants to just sit in the sun, the energy gets produced for them, and that energy again um, in sugar then gets made into ATP um, in the mitochondria by cellular respiration. So the thylakoids, again, are where photosynthesis occur, and the thylakoids are these individual discs, and they're stacked in stacks called grana. So one stack is a granum. So thylakoids are stacked in grana throughout the chloroplast. The inside of the space, the space inside is called the stroma. And that's where uh, glucose is produced inside of the stroma. So the stroma is analogous to the matrix of the mitochondria. So a lot of different terms. This is maybe why um, flashcards um, are very helpful or a Quizlet app. So once um, sugar is made in the chloroplast, where does it go next? Right, it goes to the mitochondria, where it gets broken down and made into ATP. Just like mitochondria, chloroplasts have their own ribosomes and DNA, and they divide on their own. So this um, starts the question of where did eukaryotic cells originate? How did they come to be? So fossil records suggest that the first cells were prokaryotes um, almost 4 billion years ago. And the nucleus, so the first prokaryotes had DNA, but the first nucleus is believed to have evolved by invagination of the plasma membrane. It's kind of a protective layer against the, um, around the DNA gave certain cells an advantage. So that was like the early nucleus, possibly. Right? The membrane was internalized and surrounds the DNA. And that same type of process could explain how the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus originated, right? From kind of, they're like oversized vesicles that then accumulated specialized functions. They each became their own compartment um, in these eukaryotic cells and became more and more complex. The energy organelles are very interesting because those might have originated as cells themselves. So the mitochondria, for example, might have been its own prokaryotic cell. And then a eukaryotic cell engulfed that prokaryotic cell and it became a mitochondria. This is called the idea of endosymbiosis. Endo means inside, symbiosis means they're both using each other for benefit. So the eukaryotic cells would have benefited um, from the ability to utilize oxygen uh, to break down food. So the mitochondria makes ATP. So some bacteria, imagine that it was once a bacteria on its own making its own ATP. And here's a cell that cannot make its own ATP. So the cell says, hi, mitochondria, would you like a house? Would you like free protection? And the mitochondria would love the protection. So the mitochondria, um, little prokaryotic cell, enters the eukaryotic cell where it has protection. And then the eukaryotic cell gets energy made for it by the mitochondria. So that was the first supposed endosymbiosis. So that's the name of the hypothesis, it's endosymbiotic theory. So let's talk about that from the beginning. Original cell just had some DNA floating around um, in a region, and that's about 3.8 billion years ago. The cell originally um, gained a nucleus by the plasma membrane invaginating around the DNA with a double membrane. That happened about 2 billion years ago. So it took almost 2 billion years of just prokaryotes ruling uh, planet Earth. The nucleus um, surrounded the DNA. The endomembrane system then um, got accumulated by more invaginations of membrane. And that increased surface area allowed more transport of materials within a single cell. So we're getting more and more complexity. Finally, we have here is an aerobic bacterium, which is a single cell that makes um, uses oxygen to break down sugars into ATP. And now this needs a home. This cell needs energy. So these guys use each other symbiotically. And now this cell can use um, oxygen to metabolize sugars and make ATP. Those became our, uh, those were the ancestors of animal cells. This animal cell has mitochondria. 
that a later divergence of cells, like a different offshoot, might have gained chloroplasts. And chloroplasts were originally just photosynthetic bacteria. So these bacteria were able to utilize solar energy to make sugars. So plant cells, or sorry, these cells that were once just like animal cells said, hey, uh, pho photosynthetic bacterium, would you like to come inside and make uh, some sugars? And the photosynthetic bacterium said, sure. And those cells then became plant cells because plant cells have both mitochondria and chloroplasts. So this is, again, the endosymbiotic theory. It's a hypothesis um, that has several um, lines of evidence to support it, right? The idea that they're both, uh, both mitochondria and chloroplasts are the same size as bacteria. Um, they divide on their own. They have their own DNA, their own ribosomes, right? So everything kind of points to the idea that these organelles were once independently um, surviving organisms, prokaryotes specifically. So you can watch this video um, in the Connect um, website as part of the ebook. Um, I'll play just part of it here. The theory of endosymbiosis proposes that a critical stage in the evolution of eukaryotic cells involved endosymbiotic relationships with prokaryotic organisms. All right, so here you can see this is the original mitochondria. That's what a photosynthetic bacteria looks like. And that's what a mitochondria looks like. So again, some more evidence. And then a chloroplast might have come in and that became a plant cell. So this kind of shows, you can take a look at this on Connect a little more, but you can see how this and original cell diverged. From photosynthetic bacteria. And here we have the divergence of the kingdoms of life. So animal cells do not have a cell wall. Um, and the cell wall that is present in plant cells, bacteria, and fungi have multiple functions. The main function is to protect the cell. So that's kind of obvious, um, to protect the cell, but also the cell walls help make the cell have a certain shape. And right, shape determines function. So cell walls are very important um, for maintaining shape and structure, um, not only protecting what's inside of the cell. And depending on the type of organism you are, the cell wall is very different. So the thickness and the chemical composition of cell walls differs from species to species and between cell types. So for example, you should know that plant cell walls are made up of cellulose. What is cellulose? Right, it's a polysaccharide made of glucose. And that cellulose provides rigid support for the cell. So cellulose is made of glucose, and plant cell walls are very rigid, so they're often drawn as like boxes like this because they're very rigid, um, and those are made of cellulose. <clears throat> right, it's a polysaccharide. Uh, what kind of cell wall do bacteria have? And peptidoglycan cell walls. And what about fungi? So that's a molecule called chitin. So all these have carbohydrate components. So carbohydrates, remember, have a structural role as well as an immediate source of energy. So as we talk about all these organelles, think about your own analogy, but you can think of the cell as a factory. The nucleus stores the DNA, which are the blueprints of the cell, it kind of all the instructions of what needs to happen and when. Um, and inside the nucleus, it's determined which instructions have to be followed at which time. The mitochondria provides energy, so it's like the furnace, so we can have enough energy to power, power all the functions of this factory. The ribosomes are making this product. They're synthesizing protein. It then gets packaged into vesicles and shipped to their proper destination by the Golgi apparatus. If this were a plant cell, um, it would be able to also harvest the energy um, on its own and store it as sugar. And finally, um, there's a protective uh, barrier around the factory in the form of a cell wall, if you're a plant cell, but regardless, every single cell has a cell membrane. 
Every single cell has a cell membrane. Every single cell has ribosomes. Every single cell has DNA. So take a look at these pictures very closely. Um, you could sort organelles by function here. So organelles that store and clean up include vacuoles, lysosomes, and peroxisomes. Organelles that build and sort proteins are ribosomes, the ER, and the Golgi. Uh, energy organelles are the chloroplasts and mitochondria, and boundaries include the cell membrane and the cell wall. And this is a image that I scanned from a textbook I really like that you could use to build your table um, in your notes. So for each structure, know the function and know, is it present in prokaryotes, animals, or plant cells? It's a bare minimum for the quiz. And this is um, a very useful table um, from a different book that I really like that doesn't have any unnecessary information if uh, you want to talk about, uh, if you want to use an extra resource. Which part of the cell is responsible for protein synthesis? So pause here. The answer is A. Which part of the cell is responsible for sorting proteins in vesicles? So pause here. The answer is C, the Golgi apparatus. So read this question and pause here. So the answer is D, a cell wall is not present in all living things. So read this question and pause here. And the answer is small fatty acids would be able to cross the phospholipid layer. Proteins would be too large and sugars and nucleic acids are polar and hydrophilic. So they can't get through that hydrophobic um, part of the, the phospholipid bilayer. Which organelle synthesizes ATP? Pause here. And the answer is B, only the mitochondria synthesizes ATP. Which organelle breaks down fatty acids? Pause here, and the answer is peroxisomes, break down fatty acids. Which organelle synthesizes steroids? So pause here. And if you remember, uh, steroids are a type of lipid and lipid synthesis occurs in the smooth ER. So the answer is C. And now for the rest of the lecture, we will talk about the cytoskeleton um, and uh, some molecular motors. So these are some images of immunofluorescence. So these were these are specific proteins that were targeted with specific labeled um, antibodies. They're fluorescently labeled antibodies that basically like light up a certain color um, when they're exposed to a certain wavelength of fluorescent light. So they get excited and they emit a certain color of light. And that can be captured with a special uh, fluorescent microscope. So the cytoskeleton is what controls cell movement and cell structure. And the cytoskeleton consists of elaborate arrays of protein fibers that function in a variety of different things. Um, like I said, they establish cell shape and structure. They also give the cells the mechanical strength they need to withstand pressure and stress. Um, cells also move because of the cytoskeleton. And organelles can move from one place in the cell to another um, with the help of the cytoskeleton as well. So the cytoskeleton has a lot of different functions. Um, and the cytoskeleton just means the cell skeleton. Cyto is the prefix for cell. Um, so always keep that in mind because that comes up a lot. Um, but what's the purpose of a skeleton? Right? What would happen if we didn't have a skeleton? Right? We'd be a blob. We would have no structure. We would have no shape. Um, more importantly, we wouldn't be able to move. Uh, we wouldn't be able to get anywhere. Um, so the skeleton of a cell has a lot to do with a skeleton in a person. Um, it helps us get shape, structure, support, and it enables movement. Um, the difference um, is that instead of being made of bones, the cytoskeleton is made of proteins. And there are three major types of proteins that make up the cytoskeleton. 
the smallest of which are microfilaments. They're about seven nanometers in diameter. And microfilaments are composed of actin proteins. So all these are large molecules. All cytoskeletal proteins are made up of smaller parts, smaller subunits. So microfilaments are the thinnest of the cytoskeletal proteins, and they're made up of actin subunits. Intermediate filaments are intermediate in size, and those are made of protein ropes. We'll look at those. And finally, microtubules are composed of tubulin proteins, and they're as their names, right? They're tubes, they're hollow tubes. So we'll talk about all three of these cytoskeletal proteins. Uh, we can see different pictures of them here and they have a lot of different roles, not only in, in structure, um, like these feathers are made of intermediate filaments, largely. Uh, this chameleon can trans transport uh, pigment molecules to the surface of its body to tr change color because of microtubules. So, Again, but there's, you could talk for hours and hours and hours about the cytoskeleton. We'll talk about the most uh, boring first. Um, they're very important though, but they're a little uh, boring. The intermediate filaments. Uh, the main function of intermediate filaments are support and strength. So the support within a cell is maintained by intermediate filaments. Also support between cells is maintained by intermediate filaments. And they have elastic and tensile strength, so they could withstand a lot of pressure. So structural components like hair, nails, um, spikes, if you're a porcupine, or feathers, those are all very rich in intermediate filaments. So keratin is a protein. Um, some people use it to straighten their hair uh, because it adds structure. Right? So keratin is a structural protein. It's a type of intermediate filament. Um, here you can see pictures of epithelial cells and the intermediate filaments are stained in um, green and you can see how they're forming a network. So that all the cells are kind of, uh, they have support and structure. And I like to think about intermediate filaments as like a pull and peel Twizzler because they're bundles of ropes and because they're bundles of ropes, it gives them a lot of strength. There was a demonstration, I remember, that my professor showed me in college where uh, she took one roll of, like, one long sheet of toilet paper, and of course it rips very easily if you tear it. But if you take eight um, different sheets of toilet paper and you twist them around each other, it's actually impossible to tear. So she had two students come on stage and try to pull them apart, and they couldn't pull it apart. So the idea is a thin protein when wrapped around, when eight of them are wrapped, um, it could give a lot of strength and that's good for cells. All right, why do we need intermediate filaments? So let's imagine a sheet of cells. These are epithelial cells, they're one cell thick. And here we have these blue intermediate filaments nicely joining our cells. But here we have a cell sheet without intermediate filaments. So what's gonna happen when I stretch both sheets of cells? When I stretch the sheet of cells with intermediate filaments, the cells will still remain intact and together, right? That's the whole point of intermediate filaments. They help withstand stress, they give structure and support. However, if I stretch a sheet of cells without intermediate filaments, the cells will rupture and separate. So unfortunately, that manifests itself in a disease called epidermolysis bullosa simplex. So it's a hereditary skin disorder um, due to abnormally short keratins um, in skin tissue. So keratin is a type of intermediate filament. So it's a genetic disease that make defective intermediate filaments. So what happens is skin cells separate from each other and form blisters, even in response to very delicate movement. So even if like bending down, the skin cells on the back would separate because there's no intermediate filaments keeping them together. Um, so you can see over here, Without the disease, you have this layer of epithelial cells that's nice and intact, um, but over here, there's separation. And so it's like a blister. Okay, the next type of cytoskeletal protein um, is our, the ac uh, actin or microfilaments. 
So I'm going to use those two interchangeably, actin filaments, microfilament are the same thing. I know it's a little tricky. Biology is annoying like that. Main functions of actin are also cell strength, like all the cytoskeletal components, but also it has a special role in um, cell locomotion. So cell movement and cell division. In certain muscle cells, um, they, we, actin helps contract. So muscle contraction is uh, mediated by actin. So there are certain cells that have extensions called microvilli. So microvilli, these are microvilli. These are little extensions of membrane and this, again, increases surface area of certain cells. And actin is what allows these protrusions to have structure. So these are made of actin. Actin also gives cells their normal structure. Um, it also helps certain cells move um, using pseudopods, as I'll soon show you. And cells also are dividing because of actin. Actin helps the cytoplasm split into two um, during cytokinesis. So pseudopods are these protrusions of actin um, that propel motile cells. So any cell that could move um, is relying on actin, polymerization and depolymerization. So what does that mean? It's a little confusing, so I wanna show you a video first. Um, this is a single celled amoeba, and you're gonna see actin in its cytoskeleton growing and then shrinking. So the idea here, you can see, this is the membrane, and this is a network of actin or microfilaments. So these keep on getting built and built. And as these networks of actin get built, the cell membrane pushes forward. And if you follow that with a depolymerizing protein that chops them up, you can actually push a cell upward. So let's watch that in this video. So this single cell amoeba over here is using actin polymerization to put out these pseudopods these false feet, and these are pushing out also organelles have to move along them. Okay, so this is the nucleus, for example, that's moving along. The cytoskeleton is also moving that up. But the reason why this cell is moving is because of actins growing right over here. So as actin is growing and growing, it's pushing the cell forward. And then back here, actin is being broken down, and that's how the cells moving forward. So that's done by actin. And you can watch this video over here. What is not a function of intermediate filaments? Good pause here. Right, the answer is C, right? They do not help cells move around. That's like the point. They don't want to keep cells together. Or sorry, they don't want to keep cells moving around. They want to keep cells together. They want to keep them supported. They want to keep them uh, maintain their shape. So intermediate filaments um, do everything, A, B, and D, but they do not help cells move around. Finally, we'll talk about microtubules, my personal favorite. And these are the protein tracks on which cellular materials are transported. Microtubules also provide support for the cell. And microtubules are tubes of proteins that are made of tubulin. So tubulin is a dimer, meaning there's actually an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. So this is a, tubula, a tubulin dimer. And these are one microtubule is a cylinder of these tubulin dimers stacked one after the other. So it goes alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, tubulin. Each of these little strands is called a protofilament. So one microtubule has 13 of these protofilaments arranged in a ring, and there's a space inside. A lumen is like an empty space. It's actually not an empty space we now know. There's uh, actually research being done uh, that uncover there are other proteins working on uh, some important functions inside the lumen. One of my professors, the same professor as the toilet paper, actually, that's her primary specialty is uh, um, Daniela Nicastro. She discovered some proteins that reside in the lumen of microtubules. Um, so anyway, microtubules are tracks um, and they grow from a certain station called the microtubule organizing center. 
as that in animal cells is called the centrosome. So the microtubule organizing center is the centrosome in animal cells. It's right outside of the nucleus, it's the center of the cell on a non-dividing cell sometimes, most of the time. And the centrosome is where microtubules come out of. So the mTOC is the microtubule organizing center. And in animal cells, the microtubule organizing center is the centrosome. Plants have a different system that we're not going to talk about in this class. Within the centrosome, you would find two centrioles, which help the microtubules form. Uh, confusingly, centrioles themselves are made of tubulin. So they're types of microtubules themselves, but they have a different pattern of arrangement as, um, as we'll see in other structures. So centrioles are very important in cell division because these, these duplicate uh, right before the animal cell can divide and they go to opposite sides of the cell and allows the microtubules to pull the chromosomes apart. So centrioles are very important to make microtubules in cell division. They also give rise to cilia and flagella for cell movement. So cilia and flagella are both like hair-like projections that could move cells, that could help cells move. So this is what uh, centrioles look like. They have this kind of pattern. They have uh, nine triplets of microtubules with um, nothing in the center. So microtubules have two ends. Um, we have a minus end and a plus end. They're not really charged or positive or negative, but just for convention, the minus end is always attached to the centrosome. So the plus ends are like facing the outside of the membrane. And microtubules are always growing and shrinking, but they do so at the plus end by the addition of tubulin subunits. So if they want to grow, more and more tubulin gets added here, or they shrink at the same end um, when tubulin gets released. So they're constantly being built, polymerizing, and being broken down. So it's very dynamic. And I want to show you a video of that um, after this slide. So where are microtubules assembled? And C, the centrosome. Good. So now I want to show you how dynamic microtubules are. So these are microtubules. Um, this is the centrosome over here. See, right away, microtubules start growing and shrinking. This is called dynamic instability. They're always growing. So it's like train tracks, but the train tracks are always moving and shifting around the cell as needed. So how do materials get transported throughout the cell? We need special proteins called motor proteins. And motor proteins are molecular motors that physically travel on these microtubule tracks. And it sounds crazy maybe, but they're really there in every single one of your cells right now. There are two major groups of motor proteins that travel on microtubules. Kinesins. Kinesins are one group. Those all move toward the plus end of microtubules. So right now, tell me where would a kinesin go? Would it go toward the outside of the cell or inside from the outside in? So since they're plus ended, they, they go to the plus end, that means they're going to go toward the outside of the cell. Since all of the plus ends of the microtubules are toward the outside of the cell. So kinesins can only move in one direction. Dynines, dynines move toward the minus end. So those move in the opposite direction. So the motor proteins are represented in um, black and uh, red are the kinesins. So these are the kinesins that are all moving toward the plus end of this green microtubule. And they're carrying a different cargo. This one's carrying a big vesicle that has stuff inside that needs to go over here. This might be an organelle that needs to be transported in a different direction of the cell, right? This can be another vesicle that has other materials. So these motor proteins are physically moving with the energy of ATP, of course. They're moving on microtubules, carrying different things. 
And the dionines would do the same idea, but in a different direction. The dionines are minus n directed, so they only move toward the centrosome. So this, again, is th this is how organelles get transported within the cell. Um, this is how neurotransmitters get transmitted through neurons, right? They have to move somehow. So they get transported in vesicles, and these vesicles walk on microtubules. And you can see that here. This was the video we saw on the first day um, on the first class was this inner life of a cell. And this is a microtubule. You can see those tubulin subunits, alpha, beta. And this is the motor protein, kinesin. And it's walking. It's taking step-by-step -step walks on the microtubule as it's holding onto a big vesicle. And this vesicle just came from the Golgi apparatus. And now it's going toward the outside of the cell. So this is how exocytosis happens. After this got set, uh, packaged by the Golgi, it's being exported and carried step by step by this motor protein. And you can watch these videos um, with this link down here. And this is of course all done by ATP. So with every step that a kinesin takes on a microtubule, an ATP molecule is required. So notice how this, here's one step being taken, and this head of kinesium is just charged with ATP. Once it releases that phosphate, then it's going to take one step over. This one was just charged with ATP, and then this can take a step over. Right? And now another ATP can come here and charge this one. So after this one's done, this one's going to take another step over. So this happens of course, in your every single one of your cells right now, uh, because you need to get proteins in different places. You need your neurons to transmit uh, neurotransmitters. So we have to be very thankful for these motor proteins and microtubules. Certain cells um, also have cilia or flagella to help cell movement. So this is a paramecium that's covered in cilia, these little hairs. And those protrusions are made of microtubules. The way those cilia move are because they use the energy of ATP. Um, so they have a certain stroke. Cilia do this beating back and forth stroke, whereas flagellum, which means a whip, it's more like a whip-like propeller motion. So microtubules make of cilia and flagella that help different cells move. So cilia are the hair-like projections we have these along our mucous membranes and the respiratory tract because we need to sweep away any dirt, dust, pollen, or any pathogens. Um, we don't want it in our skull, right? We don't want them in our brain. We want them away. So if we inhale something through our nose, for example, the mucosa, all those little cilia will start brushing them back in the back of your throat so they could be digested by the stomach acid and not uh, in any place harmful. So that's one example of how cilia move things around. But this paramecium gets around, it's a single-celled organism, it moves around by beating its cilia. So cilia beat back and forth um, because of the ATP and the motor proteins that are inside the cilia. Flagella are long whip-like projections also containing microtubules. Um, Sperm cells are the only animal cells, um, the only human cells that have flagella. So the only human cells that have flagella are sperm. Otherwise, flagella are um, often seen in single-celled organisms. So here is a video. Of, it's not very, um, it's not the best quality. This is Chlamydominus. These are two flagella. So this is a cell that's embedded in like a thick goo. So you can see the flagella kind of beat. And this is an algae, so Chlamydominus. They have an eye spot, so they're trying to look for, um, look away for predators and um, look for food. And they're getting around because of their little flagella. So that's microtubule based. Here, another one. Here, these are the paramecia the single-celled protists that have cilia and the cilia beat really rapidly because of those motor proteins. 
So there you can see a nice picture of the cilia beating on the single cell paramecium, which is a protist, so it has a nucleus. So inside of these flagella, you have an arrangement of the microtubules um, and motor proteins, specifically dynein. And it's very hard to um, illustrate um, without me being there. But inside the cilia and the flagella, microtubules slide against each other um, with the help of dynein. So dynein kind of moves up and down. And as a result, the whole structure bends back and forth. Um, if you hold your two fingers very close together, so put your two pointer fingers close together in front of you. And if you try to move, if you hold them very close together and you still try to move them up and down, you'll see that your fingers kind of move right and left with enough pressure. So dynein just allows those microtubules to slide up and down past each other. But because they're anchored in such a way, um, so they're tied together in such a way that it causes a bending back and forth. And there's a good demo I could do in person, but unfortunately, this is the online version. So again, here's the full structure, uh, uh, the full list of structures you should memorize, including the cytoskeleton. And we've talked about all of um, the basic organelles of animal and plant cells. But within each multicellular individual, there's a lot of different cell structures and functions, right? So you have other um, specializations that each cell takes on. So a muscle cell um, looks very different than a neuron. So you're going to see in the lobster simulation, it has you construct different types of cells. Um, and just because they all have a Golgi apparatus, a nucleus, and uh, a lysosome doesn't mean that they all look the same. Muscle cells have um, different types of proteins that are abundant in them. Neurons have different kinds of structures in them. Um, and I'll give you a hint for the lobster. There might be some information that's a little advanced. So make sure to read the theory tabs um, in that virtual lab uh, because that will explain everything for you. Right, and like in a plant, for example, they all have the same DNA. Every single cell in a plant has the same DNA, but only some of the leaf cells have chloroplasts so they can carry out photosynthesis. But underground roots do not have chloroplasts, but they have the same DNA as the leaf. So this is the last video I'm going to leave you with. This is um, one of the required videos. It's probably one of the best online. Um, you should know this inside and out. Um, so I'm not going to make you watch this now because you have the link and it's embedded um, online, but definitely watch this. It walks you through each and every organelle. It's a nice image and it even includes um, some of the cytoskeleton. And here's another cool video that's um, just very interesting if you're interested in watching. So to summarize everything, we said Cells all have DNA that encodes proteins. All cells have a cell membrane and a cytoplasm and ribosomes, right? And proteins are produced at the ribosomes. All cells might be either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. If they're prokaryotic, they belong to either domain bacteria or archaea. If they're eukaryotes, they have organelles, including a nucleus, mitochondria, Right, we know lysosome, peroxisome, Golgi, endoplasmic, partic endoplasmic particulate. Uh, if you're a plant cell, you might have a chloroplast. And the cytoskeleton makes up the structure and support. And that, that included the intermediate filaments, actin, and microtubules. So this, um, I also suggest watching this video that is embedded in the Connect online book. Um, so this might be a nice overview of everything we spoke about. So that is all for chapter four. Um, the quiz upcoming will be just on this chapter. And please complete LR4 by Thursday. Um, and I hope you have a thorough and uh, comprehensive understanding of what goes on in each and every cell. And next time we're going to zoom in on the cell membrane 
and talk a little bit about how the membrane controls what goes on in the cell and how it really is like the brain, the B-R-A-I-N. So until next time, after this.